So it's a pleasure to announce today's speaker, Chris Haber. Chris comes from Hitz from Heidelberg. Hitz is not a record company. It's the Heidelberg <laughs> Institute for Theoretical Studies. It's a new institute uh, in Germany. And he works there in Volker Springles group. Before going to Hitz, Chris was uh, undergrad at the University of Michigan. And then uh, he was a grad student at Harvard, where he worked with Lars Herkvist and a bunch of postdocs, including myself. And he got interested in issues of radiation transfer to dusty ISM, which led him to studies of submillimeter galaxies. And actually, the origin of submillimeter galaxies was basically the main topic of Chris's thesis. And after graduating, after getting a PhD, he moved to Heidelberg, where he's working on simulations of galaxy mergers and galaxy interactions by applying really moving the high range to study these galaxy interactions. <laughs> so, with that introduction, Chris, please take over. Thanks, Nisha. Um, so I'll uh, turn the lights down here so you can see the images and movies. Uh, so I'll just warn you at the beginning, uh, the first time that I gave this talk, the entire audience fell asleep during it. So uh, <laughs> if you fall asleep, don't feel bad. But I'll add additional information that the entire audience in this case was my uh, three-month-old son. So you know, <laughs> that's, it's a, a bit of a low bar in that sense. Uh, so as uh, Dushan says, um, I, I work on simulating uh, galaxy mergers. And um, the, the principal thing we want to do is be able to compare very directly with observations. And uh, I will talk a lot about that and then also about use of this um, new uh, moving mesh hydrodynamics technique. All right. So first, uh, simulating galaxy mergers. Why do we do it? Uh, how do we do it? Well, th this has been done for decades, so, um, basically since the 70s with Tumray and Tumray is when it really um, took off. And so what I just want to illustrate on this slide is um, this is the antennae galaxies. And uh, here is a model, a very simple model with um, test particles that Tumray and Tumray came up with just to match the sort of general uh, morphological features in terms of the nuclei and then also the extended tidal features. And they found they could get a uh, nice match. And at that time, um, this uh, so-called merger paradigm was, you know, was completely new, and people basically just saw a lot of um, weird-looking galaxies, and they didn't know what they were. So this was a pretty novel suggestion to say that maybe these different kinds of weird-looking galaxies are related in um, a merger-driven uh, evolutionary sequence. So this is shown in um, more detail um, in this movie, which um, this was made by someone at Space Telescope. Uh, they took a simulation from Mijos and Hernquist, just an n-body simulation, gravity only. And at different times in the simulation of this galaxy merger, they uh, stopped the simulation, rotated around a bit, and then fade out to observed uh, galaxies. So like right here, it stops. And now we'll see rotate, and it'll fade to observed. So uh, it does this at various times in the simulation. And what this illustrates is that uh, even with just simple n-body simulations of, uh, of major mergers, you can um, at least unify the uh, morphology of very different looking peculiar galaxies as uh, different time snapshots of this uh, single merger. So this was a very, um, a very nice development. It was a very good way to, to make sense out of what we observe in the universe. And um, there's been a, a, you know, that's, that's something quite nice. Uh, furthermore, so there's supposed to be another movie here that wasn't working, but I'm sure you've seen it before, just a movie from Volker Springle uh, demonstrating the effect of including sub-resolution model for AGN feedback in these simulations. So basically, when you have the uh, final starburst um, at the coalescence of the merger. You drive in a lot of gas. You feel your black hole. It emits a lot of energy, uh, heats up the surrounding ISM, and truncates the star formation. Um, so you can also use these sort of simulations to put in uh, simple, uh, s simple models for um, physical effects that might be important. And you can explore them in a more realistic way using the simulation. So you can do sort of numerical experiments. However, there's some limitations with um, these uh, decades of previous work. So the uh, first thing is is that um, when I showed you these, we we're looking at um, well, in, in Folger simulation, you can see the gas density or temperature, uh, but you're you're not looking at light. That's what we observe from galaxies. We observe light, but when normally when you look at a simulation, you have intrinsic physical quantities. So you require a uh, another step of inference to translate two observables, either from the simulations to observables or from observables to things like the uh, mass distribution. Okay. The other issue is that um, 
especially recently, it's been appreciated that there are some inherent um, inaccuracies in the smooth particle hydrodynamics technique, as implemented in uh, the popular code gadget, for example. And uh, it's possible that these inaccuracies can cause the results of your simulation to be to be incorrect. What's the nature of those? Is it the boundary effects? Uh, yeah, so, so I'll, me I'll mention that um, later on, but there's, there's a, a variety of them. So one of them is the spurious surface tension, um, suppression of mixing. Uh, but I'll, I'll have a slide on, on this. So to someone especially that's not involved in this, it might seem that these two things are maybe a little bit uh, nitpicking, and the simulations have a lot of success, and you know, why should we worry about this? Well, what I'll uh, argue here and hopefully demonstrate to you is that, in some cases at least, when you address these limitations, um, you end up getting a qualitatively different answer. So your predictions uh, for observations, your understanding of the observed universe based on your model is different uh, when you address these things. And the, the uh, application I'll show this for is the um, submillimeter galaxies. So what are submillimeter galaxies? Well. In the, uh, in the late 1990s, um, you had single-dish submillimeter telescopes observing the universe in the submillimeter for the uh, first time. They, this is an uh, image of one of the maps from the Hughes et al. Uh, Nature paper, 1998. You see these things, these bright uh, blobs. These are the so-called uh, submillimeter galaxies. I personally prefer the term uh, submillimeter source because that's actually what you're detecting, and we'll see why this is important later. But nevertheless, they're originally called submillimeter galaxies and still are. Um, because they were detected in the submillimeter, but they appeared to have no optical and UV counterparts, um, but you could find them if you integrate long enough. But um, it turns out these things are incredibly dust obscured. You know, almost all of their luminosity is emitted in infrared. <coughs> so uh, the infrared luminosities are in the range of 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14 solar luminosities. And so just for comparison, uh, 10 to the 12 is what you call an ultra-luminous infrared galaxy. 10 to the 13 you call hyperlurks. I mean, these things are, are really bright. And if you look in the local universe, one of the uh, most extreme local galaxies, ARP220, it has a luminosity of only of order a little bit over uh, 10 to the 12. So even our, our sort of most extreme local galaxies are really puny compared to these things, which are at redshifts about 1 to 5, median is around uh, 2 and a half to 3. So uh, when these were discovered, the first question is, well, you know, what are they? Um, because in the local universe, if you look at ULERGs, things that are the most infrared luminous, they tend to be late stage uh, major mergers, where you have strong starbursts being fueled by the um, gravitational uh, mutual tidal torques exerted upon one another, also with uh, strong AGN activity often. So uh, if you see a new population, you say, well, my zeroth order assumption is just that these things at high redshift. It's probably like the local universe. They're also probably late stage major mergers. So this was the uh, working assumption for the SMG population for quite some time and often still is. So uh, I illustrate this here. I just picked a few of the uh, more extreme examples. So you have the top one here. Most submillimeter galaxies are major mergers, evidence for major mergers, properties of a major merger. And uh, this is a very common, um, common theme in the literature. And often observers sort of set out to show this, and then they show this. Uh, but there is, you know, there is evidence, like in this case here, this is a, um, they followed up one of these single dish submillimeter sources, one of these blobs I showed in this slide, uh, followed it up with the SMA, submillimeter array, so they have uh, much better resolution. They resolve the source into two, you know, still looking kind of blobby things, but they have kinematics consistent with uh, disks, and this appears to be a, uh, a merger. But the thing to note is in this particular example, these, this is not a late stage merger. These things are separated by tens of kiloparsecs in projection. So this isn't your archetypical uh, local Euler where the nuclei are very close. They're, they're almost um, you know, at final coalescence. This is at an earlier stage. However, uh, some people question whether, uh, whether indeed this can be the case. Uh, the reason for this is that, uh, in particular, the semi-analytical modelers who um, they had no reason to worry about the submillimeter before these observations came out. But once they came out, they said, well, in our models, do we have these things? The answer was no, not by a couple orders of magnitude. So in uh, 2005, um, the Durham group uh, came out with this paper, Baudel 2005. And uh, what they tried to do is in their semi analytical model, they said, uh, we want to reproduce the observed number counts of this population. Okay. How can we change our model in order to uh, reproduce the population? Um, but not break any of the agreement we have with, with other things like the redshift zero stellar mass function. 
So I show uh, one of the plots from their paper. These are the cumulative number counts. I'll show number counts uh, plots a lot in this talk. So this is the number of sources with flux density greater than the flux given on the x-axis per degree squared. And uh, this is uh, observed frame 850 micron uh, flux density. So this is tracing the uh, Rally Gene's tail of the dust emission. So they, they tried um, different things. I mean, especially at that time, uh, less so now, but it's still the case. Um, dealing with semi-analytical models, it's kind of a, a bit of black magic that you have to sort of know what to play with and have some intuition and, t and tune things, try to, to fix uh, or modify your model um, you know, by, by hand, uh, really. And this, this is what they did. They said, well, what, what can we possibly think of uh, that would help us boost our counts to match these observed number counts? So they did a few different things, but they found out really the uh, crucial thing they had to do was uh, in their model, they have two modes of star formation. So quiescent star formation, which is just uh, normal sort of disk galaxies, um, long time scale, and then starburst. And they said, well, let's just say um, we have a, a top heavy, or actually a flat IMF, initial mass function, in those starbursts. So dn, d log m is constant with a cutoff at 125 solar masses. So this is uh, much flatter than a, say, the standard um, Saul-Peter or Krupa IMF. The reason that this helps you, so what this does for them, is they get a factor of 60 increase in the counts uh, just from, from changing the IMF, and they can match the counts. Okay? The reason this helps you is with this um, more top-heavy IMF, per unit star formation rate, you have more high-mass stars, and therefore you have a greater luminosity. For this particular IMF, it's about a factor of two. However, if you just increase the luminosity, uh, that doesn't help you enough. The other really important thing is you get more metal mass per unit star formation rate, and thus more dust about a factor of five here. So consequently, for a given star formation rate, your spectral energy distribution is getting uh, the normalizations going up, but also that extra dust is, um, per, is making the SED colder. The effect of dust temperature is, is getting lower. And so that helps boost your uh, submillimeter flux density even more. So when they make this modification, they're able to match the observed uh, counts. So and then uh, <laughs> some other people um, asked sort of uh, similar uh, questions. Because one of the, the fundamental things that here is if SMGs are major mergers, uh, you know, do we have enough major mergers out there based on just looking at, at merger rates, making some assumptions? And uh, there's some suggestions that this isn't the case. And uh, also, um, thanks to, to Dushan and others, uh, so-called cold flows or cold mode accretion has been popular in the, uh, the past eight years or so. And um, as, especially in counterpoint to mergers, because mergers were all the rage before that. So now you have people saying instead, well, we want to look at SMGs, and maybe we can say they're fueled uh, directly by, by cold flows. So that's why I put up two um, observational papers here. Uh, this is asking cold mode accretion or a major merger. And this is a uh, clumpy rotating da gas disk, which is um, yeah, connected with this, this uh, fueling mechanism for, for the disk galaxy. And um, I show here's an example of uh, SMG. This is the brightest SMG known, the observed uh, brightest unlensed SMG known, I should say. Uh, and what uh, Hodge et al. did is they looked at this galaxy for 100 hours with the VLA to map, um, to map the gas. And they get good evidence that this is a very extended, like um, 20 kiloparsecs, I think, across, uh, clumpy, um, very gas-rich disk galaxy. And it's like the brightest SMG known. So this seems to contradict at least this uh, merger paradigm. And uh, so what um, Romil Dabe and Dushan and others did is they looked in a uh, cosmological simulation, a cosmological hydro simulation, and they said, let's just uh, make the ansatz that the, we say we um, match the number counts by construction. That tells us how many SMGs are in our volume. And we say the uh, 20, let's say it's 20, the 20 most rapidly star forming simulated galaxies are SMGs. Uh, what are those, um, what properties do they have? How do they compare with the real population? And so here they show the stellar density for four of these objects and then gas density. And you see you have this sort of uh, you know, disky type things with some cold streams, uh, minor mergers fueling them. And OK, so you have mi minor mergers and cold, clumpy streams, <laughs> which, which is the limit of minor mergers. <laughs> they're, not, they're not major mergers, we'll put it that way. So, uh, they did have um, their, their most highly star forming thing was a major merger, but um, one of the, the discrepancies they pointed out is that the star formation rates for these um, SM, so called SMGs selected from the simulation were about a factor of a few less than those inferred from the observations. 
And one way you could reconcile this would be to make your IMF more top heavy, which would mean that the um, observational estimates were uh, overestimating the, the true star formation rate. Okay? But there's a potential issue here with these type of simulations. So Duchamp changed his mind a few years later, and uh, he said, wait, maybe these cold flow <laughs> things don't actually exist. I'm just poking fun at him. <laughs> Um, and that's after he got his family job. Right, right. <laughs> so this, so this slide isn't this slide isn't the topic of the talk, so we won't get into this detailed discussion here. But uh, so what I show is this is just to show an example when the numerical method can potentially have some consequences for your uh, conclusion. So this shows um, these are for cosmological simulations. Uh, one, this left column is for uh, REPO, this moving mesh hydrodynamics code I'll describe, and the right is for gadget, traditional SPH. Uh, the top is central galaxy, the bottom is for the, the halo of the galaxy. This is looking at redshift 2. And what this is encoding, it's telling you four different halo masses, um, what is the maximum temperature that, that over the history of that gas accretion, the maximum temperature that the gas uh, reached. So, um, this is telling you whether or not the the, uh, temp the gas was ever shock heated, say, to above the virial temperature, or whether it um, reached above some temperature threshold. So the only point I want to make here, and as I said, I don't want to get Dushan into a, a long discussion about this, but the only point is, okay, here are the two codes, uh, Rapo and Gadget, this agrees quite well. But um, for looking at the central galaxy as they define it, and at its redshift as it's plotted in the paper, uh, you see some differences in terms of the maximum temperatures of the gas uh, for these more massive halos. And so some people interpret this very strongly as you know, these cold flows don't exist, but I mean, the, the real picture is maybe more nuanced than this. But as I said, I don't want to argue with anyone about this. But my point is, is that one, uh, in some cases, you have to worry th whether the hydrodynamical technique that you use, whether that is affecting your results in some way. OK. So how do I get around uh, these issues? The first thing is we want to create mock observables from the simulations so that I can create also a sort of submillimeter map like I showed you, and I can compare blobs to blobs rather than my beautiful uh, simulated galaxies to observed blobs. So basically, my whole uh, approach here is to take the simulations and make them look like blobs. <coughs> so my uh, first take-home point will be that uh, in, in order to best compare simulations and observations, it's best to uh, forward model and try to create mock data and then compare that mock data to real data. And I'll explain how we do this. <coughs> so the basic steps here for all this SMG work, I, um, I use gadget simulations. I take um, 3D hydro simulations of uh, isolated disk galaxies and interacting um, uh, galaxy mergers. And uh, then we stop those simulations at different times, and we use the hydro outputs as initial conditions for radiative transfer. We perform dust radiative transfer in post-processing using a Monte Carlo method in order to create these mock observables, so uh, spatially resolved spectral energy distributions um, viewed from multiple viewing angles. So the first step is we take the star and AGN particles from the hydro simulation, so in this case from the gadget simulation. We assign those uh, input um, template spectral energy distributions depending on their properties. Then we use the, uh, the metal um, distribution from the hydro simulations, and we assume that 40% of that goes into dust. So that gives us our 3D dust distribution. So once you have your sources and your dust, you can go ahead and perform the radiative transfer. You send out 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 photon packets that um, d traverse through the dusty ISM. They're absorbed and uh, scattered by the dust. Then, of course, the light that's absorbed by the dust, that's going to be uh, re-radiated re in the infrared. And so you have to calculate... Uh, the dust temperatures uh, based on the, the, the uh, um, absorbed luminosity and uh, the grain size, and then you um, re-emit that emission in the uh, infrared. And you do this iteratively so you get converged dust temperatures. So here's an example, uh, a movie showing the kind of outputs we can get from this. This is the movie made by the uh, person who wrote the Sunrise Code, Patrick Janssen. Uh, he made this for NSF visualization, so that's why you have the fake background here, and it looks you know, very fancy. But it, um, it highlights you know, what, what we do. So what this is showing is this is a simulation where at many time snapshots, in this case, to make um, you know, a good resolution movie, uh, the simulation, the radio transfer is run on it. And these are, in each frame here is output, which it's, um, it's making a, a three-color composite, so like Sloan optical uh, bands, the same way you would look if you look at SDSS images. They're constructed in the same way. 
So when you see things like the uh, blue, um, the blue regions, those are representing young, uh, recently formed stars. You have red is either older stars or um, heavily dust obscured. So when you have that uh, starburst at coalescence, that was from dust obscuration. This coming along here, you'll see uh, the dust lane. And then there's some residual star formation in this case because this particular um, simulation uh, doesn't include uh, AGN feedback. But the point is, is that we can look at the evolution of these galaxy simulations, but we can look at them in sort of observer space, so to speak, looking at the actual, you know, what would images of these and whatever uh, wavelength bands look like. And of course, look at the, uh, the spectra of the SEDs. So is metallicity your proxy for dust? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so um, the main thing actually that I look at, because these sources are, um, the, the sources I'm most interested in are uh, unresolved. So we're really just always looking at the integrated spectral energy distributions, SEDs. So um, I just show an example of that here. So it's lambda, L lambda versus lambda. And um, I break this down into the different components to illustrate what uh, Sunrise actually does. So this input uh, blue here, this is the light from the stars and the AGN. This is the, uh, the input light, OK? And um, I broke out the AGN also separately as this um, cy cyan, or light blue line. And this is just uh, a simple uh, empirically determined template for the intrinsic AGN plus the torus that then we check, um, we, we calculate how that resulting emission is affected by the host galaxy. But we're not resolving the torus scales in here. This resolution is around 100 parsecs, 200 parsecs for these simulations. So when we propagate this uh, input light through the, IS, the simulated ISM, the uh, dust attenuation, um, absorption and scattering, removes some of that light. So you get down to this magenta curve and down to the red here. And then that light that is absorbed is re-radiated by the dust. That's the green. And so your, uh, your final is the sum of this red and the green. It's this magenta, OK? And you see we cover the UV through the millimeter. And uh, we can have very high, well, for, for uh, what theorists would call high, uh, spectral resolution. You can do spectral lines. So if you want to look at H alpha emission, for example. But usually the, the SEDs that I make are, are not so nice for uh, computational reasons. Of course, we can collapse these into images. So the top row shows, again, these three color, uh, true color, if you will, uh, composite images of an uh, isolated disk galaxy simulation viewed from face on and at uh, higher inclinations going all the way to edge on. It's as you would expect. Face on, you can see the nice spiral arms, uh, star forming regions. As you go to edge on, you're looking through the plane of the disk, so it's just really red because it's a much uh, higher column density when you look through the plane. You can look at monochromatic uh, images and different wavelengths. So here, this is in the infrared. So the MIPS 24 micron, 70 micron, 160 micron, and 850 micron. And these are all uh, rest frame. And uh, again, it behaves as you expect if you, if you observe uh, these galaxies and these bands. Um, the 24 micron is tracing the very hot dust, the uh, stochastically heated, very small grains. So you only see this around the uh, star forming regions. Whereas as you go up to longer and longer wavelengths, you're tracing colder and colder dust. And you're, so you're just tracing really um, the total dust mass. So that's why it looks much smoother in the uh, 850 micron. OK? So the nice thing about this is that there's uh, many applications. Because in principle, if we, we simulate enough galaxies, if we spend the uh, parameter space of real galaxy properties, mass, mass ratio for mergers, you know, uh, gas fraction, et cetera. And then we do the radio of transfer on all of these and just create a huge sweep of uh, simulated galaxies. If our simulations are reasonable enough, you should be able to find counterparts to your observed galaxies. So it's very nice in the sense that if, if someone's like, hey, I'm interested in, you know, let's just say XUV disks, um, can, how can I observe these? We can go into our simulations and try to find analogs, apply the same sort of selections, and look at, look at those. So we've done this for many projects, but I'm going to talk specifically about these submillimeter galaxies. So the main uh, point I want you to take away from this part of the talk is that when we do this sort of modeling and account for some important uh, observational effects, this um, tension between uh, theory, which I mentioned the semiolytical models, and also with these cosmological hydro simulations, the, the tension between the uh, theory, theoretical models for SMGs and observations, um, this, this can go away. So uh, just some beliefs about galaxy or about submillimeter galaxies now. I presented the, uh, the observational knowns uh, previously. So the first thing is, as the name suggests, there are galaxies. The second is um, the zeroth order assumption that there are local Euler analogs, meaning the most infrared luminous things locally are late stage major merger reduced starbursts, so they're the same. 
But then you have other people that say, no, they're actually not. They're these things fueled by cold flows and minor mergers, or predominantly minor mergers, however you want to define it. But the point is that they're not major mergers, predominantly. And then the final thing is that there's this tension between theory and observations, and that SMGs are you know, some sort of challenge to uh, Lambda CDM, it's sometimes claimed. I mean, that's going a bit, a bit uh, beyond, uh, because it's Lambda CDM plus baryons. But either way, it's been considered to be a sort of nagging issue that theorists have not been able to uh, deal with satisfactorily uh, until we came along. I think we've, we've dealt with it. Hopefully, you'll agree after I go through this. However, I would say that many of these beliefs here are actually incorrect. So by crossing this part out, I don't mean that they're, you know, that they're still galaxies in some sense, but I mean there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between a single SMG or a submillimeter source and a single galaxy. And this is important for the model comparison. I'll demonstrate this. The second is no, they're not primarily late-stage major merger-induced starbursts because the population is actually, I would argue, it's a lot more mixed. It's a lot more heterogeneous. But these things do contribute. Same thing here. Um, these sort of just gas-rich disk galaxies, very rapidly star-forming, they're, they're not the dominant uh, subpopulation, but they're important. And then finally, when you uh, do this more careful accounting of the different subpopulations and a more careful comparison with observations, uh, we can make this tension go away. So the first important effect here is that uh, the reason that you think, well, especially in this Vaudel model, because they changed the IMF only in Starburst, that made Starburst completely dominate the population. But since they only changed the IMF in that mode of star formation, I mean, that's a bit artificial. But nevertheless, uh, in their model, Starburst completely dominate. The problem is, is when we actually do this radiative transfer on the hydro simulations, we find out that Starbursts are not that efficient at boosting the submillimeter flux density uh, of your, your simulated galaxy, even when you increase the instantaneous star formation rate by a lot. So, so I show this in this slide here. So this is the uh, infrared SED of um, two snapshots of a major merger we simulated. And uh, the red uh, curve here is showing in this early stage of the merger, when the uh, galaxies are separated by tens of kiloparsecs, they're not strongly interacting. So they're still forming stars in the so-called quiescent star formation mode, just normal disk star formation. Okay. Uh, but they'd be blended into a single source in the submillimeter in the far infrared. At that stage, the total star formation rate is around 200 solar masses per year because these things are very massive, very gas rich, so you can still sustain very high star formation rates. And the observed frame 850 micron flux density is 4.6 milligens. Okay, fast forward in that simulation to the coalescence when you induce this very strong starburst. Your star formation rate jumps up to 4,500 solar masses per year for a very short time. So over a factor of 20 increase. However, when you look at the submillimeter flux density, it's not even a factor of two greater. Okay, and um, in the past, people would sometimes even assume just a linear scaling for um, between the submillimeter flux density and the star formation rate, just assuming a constant SED shape and using this to uh, infer things from the observation. But I think this pretty clearly can't be the the case for some simple physical arguments I'll describe now. So the first thing is is normally when one thinks about uh, converting between the bolometric infrared luminosity and the star formation rate, if you look back at, say, the Kanaka 98 review, there's always this caveat that you have to ignore any old star contamination, any dust heating from old stars. And in many situations, this works quite fine. But when you're looking at these uh, very peak, very short-lived peak phase of the merger new starburst, it's a very special time. And this assumption actually isn't very good. So you can see this if you compare the, uh, the area under the curve, so the integrated infrared luminosity, it's not a factor of 20 greater for the starburst. It's only about a factor of 7. And the reason for this is that this old star heating term is actually important. So it gives you a sublinear scaling of the infrared luminosity with the star formation rate. And by here, the old stars are, as those galaxies are falling in, forming stars at 200 solar masses per year, you have a lot of luminosity. And that infrared luminosity is important uh, at the time of the starburst. So you already have, you're already losing out from a linear scaling because of that effect. The other thing you'll notice is that the peak of the SED is at a shorter wavelength when you have the uh, peak of a starburst than when you have this earlier um, quiescently star-forming disk galaxies. The reason for this is that at that time, the luminosity is increased, so the amount of light heating the dust is higher. And furthermore, the um, dust um, in the starburst, you consume a lot of gas. And also, it uh, tends to be the metal and rich gas in the nuclear regions. So your dust mass is actually decreasing during the time of the starburst. Okay. So just from thermal equilibrium arguments, you have a higher luminosity, you have less uh, material over which you're distributing that luminosity, 
that means your typical dust temperature becomes hotter and the peak of your SED shifts to shorter wavelengths. So that further mitigates that factor of seven increase you get in the luminosity and it results in less than a factor of two uh, increase in the submillimeter flux density. So this is something that, um, that uh, Dushan and me and others that we, um, we uh, investigated this and realized that because of this, if you're looking at a merger, um, yes, you get a boost when you have that starburst happen, but it's not that extreme of a boost. It's maybe less than a factor of two. So therefore, in those early stages, especially because the duty cycle is longer for the infall stage, that must contribute also to the, to the submillimeter galaxy population. It's not just these starbursts uh, at, the, at the coalescence. So this is one important reason for that. And um, we can go ahead and we can use the 850 microns, is that, it doesn't look like it's placed. Uh, so this, sorry, this is for uh, Redshift 2. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry that about that. Yeah. yeah, so that's the, that's observed frame 850 micron at Redshift 2. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Um, so we can go ahead and we can use the results um, from these radio transfer calculations for these isolated uh, galaxies, and we can make uh, some other simple assumptions, um, star formation rate, stellar mass relation, and using the mass metallicity relation, just to get a sort of um, somewhat empirically based, but using the results of our radio transfer, it gives us a relationship between the uh, submillimeter flux density and the stellar mass. And this is uh, from an observational paper where uh, the relationship that we predict is this dashed line. These are for um, observed SMGs, and then these uh, red zoomed in here are for some uh, much fainter galaxies. But they went ahead and they plotted this up for us, and I was very um, happy to uh, see this because I didn't check this explicitly myself. But basically, you see for the SMGs, the relation actually works quite well. And you have some scatter about the relation, but there's not really any um, very huge outliers. And so this, this indicates uh, more evidence that these starbursts are, if some of these things are starbursts, it's still not very efficient at going above this relation uh, just based on steady state quiescent star formation. So the second important effect is illustrated in this movie. This is uh, taking a simulation. These are now mon monochromatic observed frame 850 micron images. And at various times during the simulation, I stop and I um, convolve these with a uh, 15 arc second Gaussian in order to mock up the effects of blending you would have in these typical, um, from these single disk submillimeter telescopes that are used to detect large populations of SMGs. So we see at various times in the simulation, if we do this, we see a blob, later on we see a blob, then we see a blob, then we see a blob, right? <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty obvious point if you think about redshift two to three, you're smearing out the sky on 130 kiloparsec scales, right? So you don't expect to resolve galaxies that are separated by tens of kiloparsecs. But the thing is, is this has important implications because I've argued before that the, um, the scaling between the submillimeter flux density and the star formation rate is highly sublinear. But if you, the, way that you, the way that you want to boost it, if you take two galaxies, say they're each forming stars at 100 solar masses, and you just put them together into a single source, that gives you a perfectly linear scaling. So this is actually a very efficient way to boost the submillimeter flux density just by smearing out the sky. Okay? So these two effects, this sort of inefficiency of starburst at boosting the submillimeter flux density, and the fact that you're using this 15 arc second beam, and therefore during a large part of the infall phase of the merger, blending these galaxies into a single submillimeter source, this has important consequences for the demographics of the population. So in uh, later work, we um, predicted the number counts from this model. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of, of how we put these simulations in a cosmological context, but I'd be glad to, to uh, explain them in detail after, but it's sort of a, a, a quite a few page method section. And the, the, the basic idea is that we use the results from the uh, isolated disk and merger simulations. We use the light curves from those, and we use a sort of a semi-empirical model for uh, merger rates and combined with the duty cycle from the simulations to, to give you the counts. And as I said, I'd be happy to discuss details of this. But the only point I want to make with this slide, so what this shows is the uh, cumulative number counts. Now it's at 1.1 millimeter, okay? The, um, all these points with error bars are different observations. The black solid line are the predictions from our model. And um, then these are some different models, including that Baudel model, this top one here. And uh, the first thing to take away is that uh, our model, which has um, fairly uh, reasonable assumptions, we're able to get a pretty good match to the uh, counts, with the exception of this Artsaga counts here, which uh, they believe are boosted by weak galaxy-galaxy um, lensing. Other people don't believe that, but it's sort of an active uh, topic of research, whether this is the case or not. But uh, in general, we get pretty decent agreement with the, uh, with the observed counts, which actually, since Ball tried to fit them, they've gone down by about a factor of two. So that's one reason they were having uh, problems 
actually. The other thing is I break this into different subpopulations. So we talked about you could have just normal disk galaxies that are not merging. They they're maybe have minor mergers, maybe some cold mode fueling them, whatever. But the point is they're not major mergers. So that contribution is shown as the uh, dash green here. Then you have two different contributions from mergers. You have this early stage when they're not strong starbursts, but they're blended. That's what I show is this dashed uh, blue. And then the late stage starburst phase, once you see a strong elevation in the star formation rate from those tidal torques, I show that as this red uh, dot dash line. So the point is, is that all of these populations contribute, these subpopulations contribute to the overall SMG population. And their contribution varies, and the importance varies with wavelength, or with uh, flux density. I show this on this slide. So this is the fractional contribution to the number counts. So I'm dividing all of these by this black solid line. So you see at the faintest flux densities, the uh, isolated disk galaxies win out. And this is just because you're in the um, exponential tail of the uh, stellar mass function. So if you go a bit fainter, you get a much uh, greater number density of these isolated disks. So they have a much bigger contribution. Their uh, contribution decreases at higher flux densities, and uh, the merger contributions increase. At the brightest flux densities in our model, you see the uh, merger induced starbursts are dominating, but these so-called galaxy pairs are also quite important. So after we um, made these predictions, uh, the first um, ALMA survey of SMGs came out and uh, gave a lot of uh, nice support for our model. So what I show here are the results. These are uh, ALMA images of dust continuum for um, single dish submillimeter sources from the LESS survey. So this is called the ALESS or a LESS uh, survey with ALMA. And what they found is that of the single disk sources they observed, uh, when they look at them with ALMA, order of magnitude better resolution, roughly half of them broke up into two or more sources. So you see all of these sources are multiple, multiple things. These are maybe single. Okay? So this is a nice support for our claim that you know, roughly half or significant fraction of the SMG population are actually blends of multiple galaxies, not just single galaxies. I show here, these are the uh, number counts from the same survey. So the um, blue are the observed uh, single dish counts. The red are the counts you get when you count up the individual components, not the single dish sources. And then they've plotted our model predictions. So the dash uh, dot green are the, our single dish counts. And then we also predicted counts for ALMA. And as I said, you get a roughly factor of two just different. Uh, we capture that pretty well. One of the strange things is that actually all of the brightest sources are resolved in multiple components by ALMA for this particular field. And we definitely didn't predict, predict that. But this is um, not generic to other fields, so the, the jury's still out about this. Yeah. So I certainly believe some of these major sources, but a number of the others don't look any different than systematic lumps in the field. What can you say about that? Well, how, how believable are some of these? So these are all, I think they only identify things that are 3.6 sigma or something like that. Um, I think that, so this. This group, I think, believes that they're real. I would say I've talked with other observational groups that think they're overestimating the contribution of these uh, blended blended things. Um, but I mean, that's yeah. The, the submillimeter uh, data reduction involves all this flux deboosting and sort of a lot of stuff that I I've read about, and it seems like a messy business. So I try to remain impartial uh, about that. I guess and I, I, I would say. Something equally as black as black. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> look, okay, look at the lower left. The faint one there looks like <coughs> a lot of those other bumps. Yeah. And well, there's that, some negative ones that are about as strong as that. And so, right. But the other one, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I disagree with all the faint sources, but there's <laughs> some that challenge my. It's answer. it's definitely an important thing to keep in mind. Let's let's put it that way. Um, but again, I you know. That's part of the confusion. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So this is something. There's still. This is really an active area, and it, you know, we, we're getting more support for our model. But whether all of these are real sources or not, I mean, there's still a lot of open observational things about this, and that's why you know, hopefully people will get more on the time and uh, continue to follow these things up. So uh, we also have good agreement with the predicted uh, redshift distribution. So this is a plot from uh, Vice et al. from the South Pole Telescope detected sources. The uh, shaded red and the red lines here, the error bars, are the um, observed distribution. Then the black is ours. Uh, the means agree quite well, so our model's not crazy in that regard. Uh, however, all of this that I showed, I actually um, didn't introduce. There's one additional complication that, that um, I didn't treat in this particular work, but we treated in later work. 
the uh, idea behind this is that because you have the negative K correction in the submillimeter, meaning that as you go out to higher redshift, you're moving up the rally gene's tail and it's canceling out that uh, dimming from redshift, um, you can detect uh, SMG basically equally well at redshift 1 and redshift 10 for the same intrinsic SED. So I have a long um, column in redshift over which I, I'm detecting sources. Furthermore, I have a big beam, 15 arc, arc seconds. So that means there's a, uh, there could be a pretty decent chance of just getting chance projections of galaxies that are, you know, say, separated by one in redshift or something, completely unrelated. And there's some anecdotal evidence uh, for such things. There's a, uh, about three sources that were published in a, uh, a letter where they showed this was the case. So I just show this here. This is for some uh, a cosmological simulation just to illustrate this idea. So by some criteria, you would call all of these uh, colored points some galaxy pairs. But then if you look, uh, now this is the redshift direction, you actually see that only a few of these are actually close in redshift, and other ones are just these uh, projections. This is just a schematic to illustrate this effect. But we went ahead and uh, tried to model this effect just in a crude way by taking the Bolshoi uh, n-body simulation and using the results of our um, model previously described to assign some millimeter flux densities to these um, mock sources in, in the light cones uh, from Peter Beruzzi. And we went ahead and we just um, applied different levels of blending by, by grouping sources depending on their separation, okay? And so I show again the um, number counts here uh, for the model, and the error bars are the dispersion amongst different mock uh, fields of two degrees squared each. And you see as you go from no blending to a seven arc second beam to a 15 arc second beam, you can actually have a pretty significant um, effect on the counts, uh, especially at the, the fain end where you also have a, a lot of variance. Um, the method we use here actually overestimates the effects of blending a bit, but it, it still illustrates that these uh, chance projections can be pretty significant uh, contributors, and it's important to consider if you want to match these um, single dish counts. My sort of method for the future is just to really try to look at Alma stuff because it's a lot cleaner if you can actually resolve these into individual galaxies. Um, so one thing that's robust is if you look at the distribution of the uh, redshift separate, this is a log of the redshift separation of the individual components, and this is for uh, different beam sizes and flux cuts. But the important thing you see here is that re regardless of these assumptions, you always see this bimodality, where here these things are all close in redshift, mergers or groups physically related, and then here these things are all chance projections. So we predict that a significant uh, fraction of these blended sources have at least one component that's physically unrelated to the other ones. And uh, at the point when they go ahead and follow up those ALMA sources I showed you, with, uh, they get spec Zs, then they can say um, what fraction this is uh, true for, and they can say what the typical redshift separation is, which we made predictions for. And these are actually bona fide uh, predictions, not the normal theorist predictions of you know, something that was observed 10 years ago, I predicted it now. This is something that's not constrained yet, so we'll soon find out whether I'm correct or incorrect. And I hope I get a uh, permanent job before that happens, though. <laughs> OK. But now the final part of my talk, you might have heard I was saying a little bit there's some problems with SPH, uh, the traditional formulation of it at least. Uh, and I told you I was using SPH for all this work. So why should you trust anything that I just said, all these results in the radiative transfer? Well, we investigated this. So this is the last, the last bit. I'll hopefully show you things look OK in that regard. So the take home point here is that uh, unlike for some cases, so Dushan and others have worked on a lot for um, cosmological simulations, and they demonstrate that there can be some pretty um, significant differences in the results, just depending on whether you use gadget or this moving mesh code or repo. But for these idealized merger sh simulations I've been using, they actually are pretty similar. And I'll explain why that is. So uh, this is just the one slide to um, show you or remind you about some of these problems uh, with SPH. So this is showing a so-called uh, blob test, where you have a blob of dense gas with some uh, 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 lower density gas flowing past it. And uh, the, the time is going to the right, increasing time. And the top two rows were performed using SPH, and the bottom are using uh, adaptive mesh refinement, grid-based codes. So you see in the AMR codes, this blob, uh, you have a bow shock forming, and then the blob is effectively shredded, as it should be. However, in the SPH codes, you have the blob is um, staying together and just getting flattened to this kind of uh, pancake. And so this Gertz et al. paper attracted um, a lot of attention for um, illustrating this, but it's something that had been, you know, these kind of problems were known a bit before, but in the past uh, five or six years, they've been re uh, receiving more and more attention, and now people have been trying to fix some of these issues. Uh, furthermore, you have problems with damping of uh, subsonic turbulence, 
and uh, suppressing stripping of, um, of gas clumps falling into uh, to halos and idealized tests. Um, however, the uh, traditional uh, AMR codes also can have some issues. Um, what I show here is this is a um, plot from Volker Springle's uh, code paper for a repo, which shows a repo with the uh, moving mesh. And I'll, you'll see on the next slide what this means. But basically, the mesh uh, is infected with the fluid. And then this is in fixed mesh mode. This is showing a Rowley-Taylor instability, so a more dense fluid on a less dense one. And um, this is, uh, as you go to left to right, the fluid is getting larger and larger, um, just bulk all the fluid is being uh, boosted by the same velocity. So it's just shifting your, your reference frame, basically. Um, in the case of a repo, the increase in this velocity boost does not change your results appreciably. However, uh, in the fixed mesh mode, uh, it's, it tends to suppress this instability because there's a uh, velocity dependent uh, truncation error. So using the same resolution, you can tend to uh, suppress the instability <laughs> as you increase that um, bulk velocity. Um, so Volker went ahead and developed this uh, moving mesh hydrodynamics code, which here is illustrated with a uh, development of a uh, Calvin Helmholtz instability, two fluids moving in different directions, left, right, left. And uh, you see the uh, grid is shown here. So these are irregular um, grid cells that are advected with the flow. So they're moving in the same direction as the flow. And you see um, nice uh, establishment of the Calvin Helmholtz instability. You have really good resolution of contact discontinuities because you're solving on a grid. But you also combine some of the advantages of SPH because it's this uh, uh, pseudo Lagrangian method. Okay, so what we've done is uh, we've gone ahead and said, well, we want to see if we use this code, a repo, and we simulate our idealized mergers with it. How do those results compare to our old uh, gadget simulations? You know, are our results robust in numerical method used? So we did this for a small set of merger simulations, and we kept all other ingredients as uh, constant as possible. Okay, so this movie illustrates a comparison. This is for a sort of merger of Milky Way type analogs. The uh, top is showing the uh, gas surface densities in the Arepo simulation and Gadget 3. Lower left shows the star formation rate versus time, and the right is the black hole accretion rate uh, versus time. And I'll show this again. So generally, uh, you see there's very good uh, agreement qualitatively in terms of when the starburst happens, when the black hole um, activity jumps, the overall gas morphology. But the fine details can differ in terms of the exact values of the star formation rate or the black hole accretion rate, the uh, gas morphology. You can have some differences there. Overall, though, I mean, there's, we show this for all the simulations. Um, the movies are all on my uh, website, and we show more details in the paper, of course. Overall, the differences uh, for these type of simulations between the two numerical techniques are much, much less than you would see um, in the cosmological simulations. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So. Well, much worse than integrated over time might be the same black hole mass, but if you would have a different unit size, it's not an issue. It's probably very different. Yeah, so that's one of the things that could change if you're looking at that particular diagnostic. That's right. So this is actually what I show here: the black hole masses versus time um, for this this single simulation, and the uh, blue is a repo mm -hmm. results, red is gadget, and then dashed are lower resolution simulations. So this is one of the things that can differ: the black hole masses you get can differ by a factor of a few, maybe even order of magnitude. But you can also have a factor of a few difference with uh, resolution, which isn't actually, it's not a, I don't show this plot, but I have a higher resolution run for a different simulation. Uh, it doesn't appear to be systematic. But the point is, is you can get some significant differences in the black hole masses. But this also isn't that much of a concern, because the black hole masses are sort of, um, the final masses are basically set so that they lie on the, um, uh, the uh, M sigma relation, because in these simulations, your feedback efficiency that you assume is basically what's setting the final black hole mass. So people will ask sometimes, oh, well, is a repo or a gadget, uh, do those black holes lie in the M sigma relation? Well, you could do whatever you want with that. So the only important thing to take away is that you can have uh, systematic differences in the black hole mass, both with resolution and with the code use. And this kind of makes sense, because uh, this is much more sensitive than, say, the integrated star formation history, because that black hole is just sensitive to the, de the density at the very central regions. And uh, also, as it's undergoing exponential growth, you can really ampli amplify small differences uh, because of that rapid growth. You have some differences in the morphology. So here I just show an example in the post-starburst phase for a repo and for gadget. In the gadget simulations, you tend to have um, a lot more um, clumpiness here, and this is consistent with um, 
the cosmological simulations, for example. <clears throat> now, um, the gas phase structure, I showed by a, this is a movie showing the evolution of um, temperature versus density uh, throughout the merger for a repo and for a gadget. And this is just encoding the color bars, encoding how many, um, how, what fraction of the total gas mass are in these different regions of phase space. So the main thing to take away here is that the, in the early stages, the uh, gas phase structure is very similar. But one of the um, salient differences that comes out is at late times, you have, uh, in a rainbow, you have gas cooling from the hot halo that forms in the merger back onto the star formation, the star forming equation of state, whereas in the gadget simulations, you don't see that. But still, these are uh, relatively subtle um, differences, but it could be important for things like how well you can um, quench star formation, for example. You can get a residual, like, half a solar mass per year in this simulation that you don't have in this one, for example. Okay. Skip this. So basically, uh, just to conclude here, um, so it might, for those of you especially that have been following this literature, it might be a bit confusing that, uh, or you maybe heard some talks. Lars uh, Hernquist has been giving a lot of talks and might say that you know SPH is always wrong and shouldn't be used for anything, or other people say you know SPH is perfectly good and you know should use it for for everything. Uh, but the situation is is that from these various comparisons that have been done, there's some regimes for which this even just in its most basic, um, you know, not not any of the new forms of SPH, just the traditional form, works just fine. There's some cases where it doesn't seem to be the case. So uh, based on my work and the work of others, uh, some of the cases where traditional SPH works is in a su supersonic turbulence for the intergalactic medium, so for gas on, um, on very large scales, for these sort of idealized disk and merger simulations, especially um, before the uh, starburst or before these, this hot halo forms. And what these all have in common are that in these regimes, the uh, gas phase structure is relatively simple. You don't have really strong uh, contact discontinuities. And the uh, thermal energy is subdominant to other sources like kinetic energy. Okay. So some of the issues with SPH are that you can have um, noise the, uh, in the uh, thermal energy. But if your thermal energy um, doesn't matter, then you don't really care if that's, if that's inaccurate. Okay. But the converse uh, side of this is that in applications where those conditions are the opposite, where you have complex gas phase structure and the thermal energy is important, then you, you can have inaccurate results. So for example, for subsonic turbulence, where there it's no longer the, the kin kinetic energy that's dominating, this, this, uh, the results of SPH and this moving mesh approach can differ. For gas accretion on the galaxies, which Dushan has looked at a lot, you can have some differences. Uh, he can tell you more about what the actual differences are versus what I might have said they are. So. But that's a, there are some, at least some differences. Especially late times, but the early times. Okay. So at late times, gas accretion onto galaxies. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, um, in the starburst, in the mergers, when you form uh, hot halos from shock heating and from AGM feedback, you can see some differences there. And these all share these properties that I mentioned. So really, when you're deciding you know, what method should I use, should I try to fix the SPH, should I try to write my own moving mesh code, whatever, uh, it really depends on your application. And you know, basically, anyone that comes and makes very blanket, blanket statements, uh, you shouldn't trust completely if they just say, oh, it's always good or it's always bad. I mean, that's too simplistic of an approach. So it can be understood when it, uh, traditional SPH does and doesn't work. So uh, just in summary here, uh, the whole reason I go through all of this, um, all this work uh, is to perform rate of transfer on the hydrodynamics is so I can directly compare observables with observables. In some cases, this might not matter at all, but in some cases, this can make a big difference. And so we had a series of papers on the submillimeter galaxy population where we demonstrate that if you do this sort of modeling, you get a much more heterogeneous population that uh, has number counts in agreement with the observed counts. And uh, furthermore, uh, we were a little bit worried that we had used um, the traditional uh, form of gadget for these simulations. But um, at least um, in, a, in a general sense, and except for some fine details, these gadget simulations agree pretty well for these uh, moving mesh hydrodynamic simulations. And so for this particular simulation regime, uh, it seems that the inaccuracies in SPH are maybe not so important, which is you know, something that Lars, for example, was happy about because that had been 10 years of work for him and his uh, collaborators. So. It was uh, good to see the differences weren't as extreme in that regard. And so the take home point with that is that standard SPH works well in some regimes, but uh, not necessarily in others. And uh, just an eye to the future now, I just show uh, this is a mock um, Hubble uh, ultra deep field created from a uh, cosmological hydro simulation that our group is uh, running at the moment. And uh, this is using this moving mesh code, Arepo. 
And so what I plan to do is to use this simulation, because now I have a uh, more self-consistent universe, so to speak, uh, with some caveats, of course, in terms of the input physics there. But uh, I want to go ahead and use the results of my radiative transfer, the scaling relation that I mentioned, and uh, create mock SMG catalogs from this so that I can go ahead and uh, revisit the, the work of uh, Ramil and uh, Dushan and collaborators um, and see if, if I have the same sort of issues that they had or um, something's different. Uh, it could be even as mundane as uh, resolution, for example. But this is the uh, direction we're looking at now. Thank you. Like, is there a reason not to just use the movie mesh, other than perhaps the cost of implementing a new strategy? Yeah, but well, those are definite reasons that sure. you can't just get the code, uh, <laughs> and that it would be hard to write your own. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think Dushan can answer this better. I haven't seen any published ways that it's worse, but I think maybe you know yeah, some potential issues. Problems. Maybe over the thing that someone who possibly get code because you need to have the resolution scale, but SPH doesn't mix at any scale. Mm -hmm. But that's typically can be interpreted as advantage or disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Some people question ability to conserve angular momentum properly, but I haven't seen any tests done. Yeah, so yeah. I don't think there's anything. Yeah. I don't think there's anything that's been demonstrated. But I mean, that's also. I'm sure it has some issues it, like every. Yeah, yeah. It, it's all. Form. It's also what's being presented, right? Like. Yeah. For many of the standard tests, it performs quite well. Yeah. So I mean, so you say that this code is not. Widely available. Right. Uh, if, so, if somehow that code were to leak out and people were kind of, I mean, is there an indication? <laughs> don't look at me. There's an indication that uh, that that in terms of like CPU time or efficiency, that one is preferred over the other one, or. It's, it's hard to say that because the, the thing is, is, even for, say, a fixed number of resolution elements of SPH particles or cells, you get better resolution with the moving mesh code because you have the uh, density gradient across the cell. Yeah. So you sort of have to compare you know, apples to apples in the sense of the accuracy of the solution you get. For a fixed number of resolution elements, it is more expensive. It's not an order of magnitude more expensive. Um, but, it, but yeah, it is, it is more expensive. I don't know for the cosmological simulations what the So for basically the cosmological are. application, it was only tens of percent slower. Yeah. But mm -hmm. hydro part was much slower, but most of the calculation goes on to gravity. Yeah. So that's the same code. code. So okay. overall, it's only tens of percent slower, but it comes on with much more memory, for example. But it, it was actually surprisingly fast compared to what kind of calculations are done. But just, just to add that one part that Chris kind of mentioned, but there are all kinds of other SPH codes developed in the last couple of years that are actually overcoming many of these difficulties, and people are trying to use them more and more often. There just there has not been that much literature available yet, but in the next couple of years, there are all kinds of modifications mm -hmm. that avoid these issues with contact instability, contact. Uh, Contact discontinuities. Discontinuities that that actually relates to what's going on with instabilities later on. So but it, it remains to be seen where the other issues pop up. As yeah, the yeah there will be issues with all codes in the future, but there are alternatives, and people are kind of yeah. changing how this page works and being very active field in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More Also, kind of have some like comment to become kind of AMR people, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's it's true that this uh, speed of the reference frame really matters in terms of our environments, but there's also resolution dependence. Right. Thing. So you can. That's why I, that's why I said for fixed resolution. Yeah. So you can increase to be the double increasing resolution. Right. No, I thought, I thought it's something I was thinking about earlier, but when you showed the the blended redshift. Histogram that seems to suggest that like more than half of all of the, um, the the detections were, were blended or basically blended combinations. Of things. Yeah, so I didn't show so so uh, I didn't show the I have some. So this is the um, prediction for the for the fractions. So the the thing to keep in um, mind here, one of the issues with the way that this model is, uh, 
is that because it's a base on abundance match matching to create the mock catalogs, it doesn't include the effects of Starburst, actually. Okay? So I wouldn't trust those um, in terms of the fraction of total sources, because those Starbursts are important, and those aren't okay. accounted for there. But for the blended sources, uh, what this shows is um, you can just look at the green line. So for any number of components that um, this is for this uh, so-called 15 arc second beam, which is probably overestimating the, the blending. But for sources that are composed of two, three, four, however many components, that the majority of those include at least one um, unassociated component, OK, a significantly different redshift. But the thing is, is that I don't, I don't put too much stock into any of the exact numbers here, because there's issues like, for example, what do you call a component? Is it greater than half a milligansky, one milligansky? You know, are you looking at noise peaks? Um, there's the issue with the starburst. So the exact number is hard to say. That's why I said, like, for example, the um, typical redshift separation for the unrelated sources, that seems to be pretty robust to the model. Oh, in so that's something I identify as like a robust prediction. But the overall um, number depends on a few of the assumptions fairly sensitively, I would say. But, okay. but many of them would have at least one, but it could be a, a merger. But then there's also a chance projection that's, yeah. you know, yeah. just like what that really affects your analysis, right? Like you're limited by the fact that you have this huge systematic error with yeah. the brightness that you never know yeah. being strongly affected. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you need to know this observationally. So that's why uh, they are working hard now to get uh, spec Z okay. for these resolved things. And then, I mean, that's really the way that you can constrain it is, is what fraction of these things that are may or may not be real subcomponents, what fraction of them are at are different redshifts. Because um, so far, there's only been anecdotal evidence. But if you look at that, it could already from the anecdotal stuff, it could be a very uh, non-trivial fraction that have at least one interloper <coughs> component. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question on the, the ALMA images that you showed earlier. It, it almost looked like the components were, uh, they, they almost look like area rings, that they almost look like they're Yeah, so um, these, uh, even, in, even in many of the, uh, the SMA um, observations of these, often it's like uh, Josh Younger did a lot of work with following up the single dish sources, and a lot of times those were still unresolved uh, with the SMA at like around one arc second uh, resolution. And so these, I don't remember the exact uh, resolution for, the, for this configuration of ALMA, but I want to say it was, it was of order one arc second or maybe even one and a half arc seconds, and many of these appear not to be resolved. But that's still like um, 10 kiloparsecs or so. So, well, it's so not... 10 kiloparsecs, but I mean, I can imagine if, if the starburst is extended across the black disk, you at least see some evidence of it not being a point source, even at that resolution limit. So I mean, does that mean yeah. that the starburst is very, very confined? Right. So, so something like, like I showed in the, um, the intro, this one of uh, GN20, mm -hmm. if you had something like that, you should. Uh, You should see this. This is like 10 or 20 kiloparsecs, I think, yeah. across. So if you had something like this, then you should see evidence of it, yeah. right? These are just so far away, though. But I think they're sort of intermediate regimes where it could be a very compact starburst, like something like look at local Eulergs and you know, a few hundred parsec emission region. But it still could be a few kiloparsecs across. But yeah, if it were just a 20 kiloparsec disk starbursting everywhere, you should be able to detect. Yeah. Uh, you should be able to at least somewhat resolve that. But it didn't look like any of those were, so is that yeah. Is that consistent with sort of our understanding of how the sort of size scale of starbursts? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that data is really. I mean, they look for like five minutes, uh, and each of those just for the dust continuum. And the, I haven't heard any detailed analysis of of those sort of questions, so I'm not. I'm not really sure. I, ma I imagine they're they're going into that, but really, so far they've only published about the multiplicity <laughs> number counts, things like that. But it's is that I mean, it's definitely something on their on their radar. And of course, um, also with Alma. To doing um, to get the molecular gas and, and doing you know deep uh, images to uh, see the extent of the molecular gas, how that compares to the dust, because that's that's another issue uh, there. But I think that's still pretty pretty open. Starburst are usually very compact. So the 
the extent of this are more problematic, but Starbird itself is situated in the inner cable person. Well, but that's... But that dust must get out. Wait, I mean, the itself might be in back, but if right. have dust emission, that must be... Right, and that's one of the issues. Sense. Like, in, in these in these simulations, you have, at the uh, time of coalescence with the Starburst, you have just huge optical depth, so you actually have um, dust self-absorption is very important. So in this case, mm -hmm. your tau equals one surface could be uh, much further out than the actual starburst uh, region, so that would that would have that sort of effect. Yeah. Um, whereas if you could trace maybe a very high critical density uh, CO line, that would be a smaller yeah. size than, than the dust, for example. Um, and that's that's only people say they don't know if at high redshift ones if the starbursts are as compact, right? That's yeah. that's one of the the debates. Good. Any more questions? If not, then let's thank you. For can cause the results of your simulation to be to be incorrect. What's the nature of those? Is it boundary effects? Uh, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll mention that um, later on, but there's there's a, a variety of them. So one of them is the spurious surface tension, um, suppression of mixing, uh, but I'll, I'll have a slide on, on this. So to someone especially that's not involved in this, it might seem that these two things are maybe a little bit uh, nitpicking and the simulations have a lot of success and you know why should we worry about this? Well, what I'll uh, argue here and hopefully demonstrate to you is that in some cases at least when you address these limitations, um, you end up getting a qualitatively different answer. So your predictions uh, for observations, your understanding of the observed universe based on your model is different uh, when you address these things. And the, the uh, application I'll show this for is the um, submillimeter galaxies. So what are submillimeter galaxies? Well, in the, uh, in the late 1990s, um, you had single-dish submillimeter telescopes observing the universe in the submillimeter for the uh, first time. They, this is an uh, image of one of the maps from the Hughes et al. Uh, Nature paper, 1998. You see these things, these bright uh, blobs. These are the so-called uh, submillimeter galaxies. I personally prefer the term uh, submillimeter source because that's actually what you're detecting, and we'll see why this is important later. But nevertheless, they're originally called submillimeter galaxies and still are. Um, because they were detected in the submillimeter, but they appeared to have no optical and UV counterparts, um, but you could find them if you integrate long enough. But um, it turns out these things are incredibly dust obscured. You know, almost all of their luminosity is emitted in infrared. <coughs> so uh, the infrared luminosities are in the range of 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14 solar luminosities. And so just for comparison, uh, 10 to the 12 is what you call an ultra-luminous infrared galaxy. 10 to the 13 you call hyperlurks. I mean, these things are, are really bright. And if you look in the local universe, one of the uh, most extreme local galaxies, ARP220, it has a luminosity of only of order a little bit over uh, 10 to the 12. So even our, our sort of most extreme local galaxies are really puny compared to these things, which are at redshifts about 1 to 5, median is around uh, 2 and a half to 3. So uh, when these were discovered, the first question is, well, you know, what are they? Um, because in the local universe, if you look at ULERGs, things that are the most infrared luminous, they tend to be late stage uh, major mergers, where you have strong starbursts being fueled by the um, gravitational uh, mutual tidal torques exerted upon one another, also with uh, strong AGN activity off. <laughs> So it's a pleasure to announce today's speaker, Chris Haver. Chris comes from HITS from Heidelberg. HITS is not a record company. It's the Heidelberg <laughs> Institute for Theoretical Studies. It's a new institute uh, in Germany. And he works there in Volker Springles group. Before going to HITS, Chris was uh, undergrad at the University of Michigan. And then uh, he was a grad student at Harvard, where he worked with Lars Herkvist and a bunch of postdocs, including myself. And he got interested in issues of radiation transfer to dust the ISM, which led him to studies of submillimeter galaxies. And actually, the origin of submillimeter galaxies was basically the main topic of Chris's thesis. And after graduating, after getting a PhD, he moved to Heidelberg, where he's working on simulations of galaxy mergers and galaxy interactions by applying minimally the higher energies to study these galaxy interactions. <laughs> so, with that introduction, Chris, please take over. Thanks, Dishan. Um, so I'll uh, turn the lights down here so you can see the images and movies. Uh, so I'll just warn you at the beginning, uh, the first time that I gave this talk, the entire audience fell asleep during it. 
So uh, if you fall asleep, don't feel bad. But I'll add additional information that the entire audience in this case was my uh, three-month-old son. So you know, no that's worry. it's a, a bit of a low bar in that sense. Uh, so as uh, Dushan says, um, I, I work on simulating uh, galaxy mergers and. Um, the, the principal thing we want to do is be able to compare very directly with observations. And uh, I will talk a lot about that and then also about use of this um, new uh, moving mesh hydrodynamics technique. All right. So first, uh, simulating galaxy mergers. Why do we do it? Uh, how do we do it? Well, th this has been done for decades, so, um, basically since the 70s with Tumray and Tumray is when they really um, took off. And so what I just want to illustrate on this slide is um, this is the antennae galaxies. And uh, here is a model, a very simple model, with um, test particles that Tumeray and Tumeray came up with just to match the sort of general uh, morphological features in terms of the nuclei and then also the extended tidal features. And they found they could get a uh, nice match. And at that time, um, th this uh, so-called merger paradigm was, you know, was completely new, and people basically just saw a lot of um, weird-looking galaxies, and they didn't know what they were. So this was a pretty novel suggestion to say that maybe these different kinds of weird-looking galaxies are related in um, a merger-driven uh, evolutionary sequence. So this is shown in um, more detail um, in this movie, which um, this was made by someone at Space Telescope. Uh, they took a simulation from Mihaus and Hernquist, just an n-body simulation, gravity only. And at different times in the simulation of this galaxy merger, they uh, stopped the simulation, rotated around a bit, and then fade out to observed uh, galaxies. So like right here, it stops. And now we'll see rotate, and it'll fade to observed. So uh, it does this at various times in the simulation. And what this illustrates is that uh, even with just simple n-body simulations of, uh, of major mergers, you can um, at least unify the uh, morphology of very different looking peculiar galaxies as uh, different time snapshots of this uh, single merger. So this was a very, um, a very nice development. It was a very good way to, to make sense out of what we observe in the universe. And um, there's been a, a, you know, that's, that's something quite nice. Uh, furthermore, so there's supposed to be another movie here that wasn't working, but I'm sure you've seen it before, just a movie from Volker Springle uh, demonstrating the effect of including sub-resolution model for AGN feedback in these simulations. So basically, when you have the uh, final starburst um, at the coalescence of the merger, you drive in a lot of gas, you feel your black hole. It emits a lot of energy, uh, heats up the surrounding ISM, and truncates the star formation. Um, so you can also use these sort of simulations to put in uh, simple, uh, s simple models for um, physical effects that might be important, and you can explore them in a more realistic way using the simulation. So you can do sort of numerical experiments. However, there's some limitations with um, these uh, decades of previous work. So the uh, first thing is, is that um, when I showed you these, we were looking at, um, well, in, in Folger simulation, you can see the gas density or temperature. Uh, but you're, you're not looking at light. That's what we observe from galaxies. We observe light. But when, normally, when you look at a simulation, you have intrinsic physical quantities. So you require a, uh, another step of inference to translate two observables, either from the simulations to observables or from observables to things like the uh, mass distribution. Okay. The other issue is that. Um, Especially recently, it's been appreciated that there are some inherent um, inaccuracies in the smooth particle hydrodynamics technique, as implemented in uh, the popular code gadget, for example. And uh, it's possible that these inaccuracies happen. So uh, if you see a new population, you say, well, my zeroth order assumption is just that these things at high redshift, it's probably like the local universe. They're also probably late stage major mergers. So this was the. Uh, working assumption for the SMG population for quite some time, and often still is. So uh, I illustrate this here. just picked a few of the uh, more extreme examples. So you have the top one here. Most sub galaxies are major mergers, evidence for major mergers, properties of a major merger. And uh, this is a very common, um, common theme in the literature, and often observers sort of set out to show this, and then they show this. Uh, but there is, you know, there is evidence, like in this case here, this is a, um, they followed up one of these single dish submillimeter sources, one of these blobs I showed in this slide, uh, followed it up with the SMA, submillimeter array, so they have uh, much better resolution. They resolve the source into two, you know, still looking kind of blobby things, but they have kinematics consistent with uh, disks, and this appears to be a, uh, a merger. But the thing to note is in this particular example, 
these, this is not a late stage merger. These things are separated by tens of kiloparsecs in projection. So this isn't your archetypical uh, local Euler where the nuclei are very close. They're, they're almost um, you know, at final coalescence. This is at an earlier stage. However, uh, some people question whether, uh, whether indeed this could be the case. <coughs> Uh, the reason for this is that, uh, in particular, the semi-analytical modelers, who um, they had no reason to worry about the submillimeter before these observations came out, but once they came out, they said, well, in our models, do we have these things? The answer was no, not by a couple orders of magnitude. So in uh, 2005, um, the Durham group uh, came out with this paper, Baudel 2005, and uh, what they tried to do is in their semi-analytical model, they said, uh, we want to reproduce the observed number counts of this population. Okay, how can we change our model in order to uh, reproduce the population, um, but not break any of the agreement we have with with other things like the redshift zero stellar mass function? So I show uh, one of the plots from their paper. These are the cumulative number counts. I'll show number counts uh, plots a lot in this talk. So this is the number of sources with flux density greater than the flux given on the x-axis per degree squared, and uh, this is. Uh, observed frame 850 micron uh, flux density. So this is tracing the uh, Rally gene's tail of the dust emission. So they, they tried a, um, different things. I mean, especially at that time, uh, less so now, but it's still the case. Um, dealing with semi-analytical models, it's kind of a, a bit of black magic that you have to sort of know what to play with and have some intuition and, t and tune things, try to, to fix uh, or modify your model um, you know, by, by hand, uh, really, and that's, this is what they did. They said, well, what, what can we possibly think of uh, that would help us boost our counts to match these observed number counts? So they did a few different things, but they found out really the uh, crucial thing they had to do was uh, in their model they have two modes of star formation. So quiescent star formation, which is just uh, normal sort of disk galaxies, um, long time scale, and then starburst. And they said, well, let's just say um, we have a a top-heavy, or actually a flat IMF, initial mass function, in those starbursts. So dm, d-log, m is constant with a cutoff at 125 solar masses. So this is uh, much flatter than, a, say, the standard um, Sol-Peter or Krupa IMF. The reason that this helps you, so what this does for them, is they get a factor of 60 increase in the counts uh, just from, from changing the IMF, and they can match the counts. Okay? The reason this helps you is with this um, more top-heavy IMF, per unit star formation rate, you have more high mass stars, and therefore you have a greater luminosity. For this particular IMF, it's about a factor of two. However, if you just increase the luminosity, uh, that doesn't help you enough. The other really important thing is you get more metal mass per unit star formation rate, and thus more dust, about a factor of five here. So consequently, for a given star formation rate, your spectral energy distribution is getting uh, the normalizations going up, but also that extra dust is, um, per, is making the SED colder. The effective dust temperature is, is getting lower. And so that helps boost your uh, submillimeter flux density even more. So when they make this modification, they're able to match the observed uh, counts. So and then uh, <coughs> some other people um, asked sort of uh, similar uh, questions. Because one of the, the fundamental things that here is if SMGs are major mergers, uh, you know, do we have enough major mergers out there based on just looking at, at merger rates, making some assumptions? And uh, there's some suggestions that this isn't the case. And uh, also, um, thanks to, to Dushan and others, uh, so-called cold flows or cold mode accretion has been popular in the, uh, the past eight years or so, and um, as, especially in counterpoint to mergers, because mergers were all the rage before that. So now you have people saying instead, well, we want to look at SMGs, and maybe we can say they're fueled uh, directly by, by cold flows. So that's what I put up two um, observational papers here. Uh, this is asking cold mode accretion or a major merger, and this is a uh, clumpy rotating ga gas disk, which is um, yeah connected with this this uh, fueling mechanism for for the disk galaxy. 